Welcome to Introduction to Logic, Unit 2, Lecture 3, Part 3, Testing Categorical Syllogisms for Validity. You'll recall that we define validity as the condition of a deductive argument when the conclusion must follow from the given premises. As we're about to see, this has everything to do with how the argument is structured. In the case of categorical syllogisms, that means getting the major, minor, and middle terms in the proper place in the argument. It's all about the form or structure of the argument. And to help us to visualize the form of a categorical syllogism, we'll employ Venn diagrams. We've already learned about Venn diagrams. You'll recall that a Venn diagram is composed of at least two circles representing the set or domain represented by the subject and predicate terms of a categorical proposition. By overlapping the two circles, we can visualize the logical meaning expressed in our four categorical propositions. Remember that when we overlap the circles, we get three distinct regions. Region 1 represents only those members of the subject class. Region 2 represents members of both the subject and predicate classes, and Region 3 represents members of the predicate class only. These simple diagrams are fine for dealing with categorical propositions, but a categorical syllogism has three terms, the major, minor, and middle term. Thus, we're going to need more complex diagrams to represent all three of these distinct terms. Adding a circle to represent the middle term helps us to see the possible connections that exist between all three sets. Notice that we now have seven distinct regions represented in our diagram. By filling in the information contained in the premises, we'll see what must be the case. That is, does the conclusion have to follow from the given premises of the argument? Now, a Venn diagram for a categorical syllogism will always have these three overlapping circles. The two bottom circles will always represent the conclusion, which contains the minor and major terms. The circle representing the middle term will always go on top. Now that we have our Venn diagram representing all three terms, we can simply fill in the information given to us in the two premises of the syllogism and see what follows. Let's start with a AAA Figure 1 categorical syllogism. First, let's note what each circle in the diagram represents. Note that we're using the letters S and P to represent the subject and predicate of the conclusion, which, of course, are the minor and major terms, respectively. M will represent, of course, the middle term. Next, let's write out our argument in standard form. Note that we begin with the major premise, which contains the predicate of the conclusion. Since this is a figure one syllogism, the middle term is going to be in the subject position of the premise. Next, we add the minor premise. And since again, this is figure one, the middle term goes in the predicate position. Finally, we add the conclusion. Now we're ready to add the information contained in the premises to our diagram one premise at a time. We start by adding the information from the major premise, which tells us all M R P. This is the way we would normally do it, unless one of the premises was a particular proposition. If you have a particular and a universal proposition as premises, always start with the universal claim. But in this case, they're all universal, so it doesn't really matter, we'll start with the major premise. So notice that we have shaded out regions 1 and 2 because the major premise tells us that every single thing that is an M is also a member of the class of P. So there can be no M's outside of the region of P. Now that we've eliminated all the M's that aren't P's in the diagram, we can see that the remaining M's are also members of the P class. So we're finished including the information from the first premise on our diagram. 
Now let's move on to the minor premise. The minor premise tells us that all the members of S are also members of M. So we've now eliminated everything in regions 5 and 6 as well. Region 2 is, of course, already empty because of the major premise, so we don't need to do anything else with that region. Now that we've entered the information from the minor premise, notice that regions 3, 4, and 7 are the only ones left. Having assumed that the major and minor premises are true, does it follow necessarily that all the remaining members of S are also members of P? We see that it does. This means that the argument is valid. The conclusion must be true if the premises are true. Of course, we don't know what M, S, and P actually stand for, and it really doesn't matter. What matters is that the form of the argument, the orientation of the major, minor, and middle terms, forces the conclusion to follow from the given premises. No matter what we fill in for the variables, any categorical syllogism of the form AAA1 will always be valid. Now, let's try another one. For an EOI2 argument, the major premise will contain the predicate of the conclusion, that is, P, and the middle term will be in the predicate position. The minor premise, which contains the subject of the conclusion, will have the middle term also in the predicate position, again because this is a figure 2 argument. Now let's add our conclusion. Next, we can create our Venn diagram to visualize the logic of the argument. Remember that the bottom circles represent the subject and predicate of the conclusion, and the middle term goes on top. Now that we've got our diagram all set up, we're ready to add the information asserted in the premises and see whether or not the conclusion will have to be true given that information. Also, note that we have universal and particular premises in this particular argument, and whenever that happens, we always start with the universal premise as a rule. But of course, again, in this case, the universal premise is the major premise, so that's where we're going to start. If it happened to have been a particular premise that was the major premise, we would want to fill in the information from the universal premise first. Now, the major premise tells us that there are no shared members of P and M, so we've shaded out regions 3 and 4. The minor premise asserts that there's one member of S that's also a member of M, so we've now placed an X in region 2, just as this premise tells us. We've now demonstrated on the diagram what is asserted in the premises, so we can ask ourselves, does the conclusion have to be true assuming that the premises are true? Is the case that there must be at least one S that is not a member of P? We see that it is, so this argument is also valid. And again, it doesn't matter what S, P, and M stand for, the form of an EIO2 argument will always be valid. We could now proceed to do Venn diagrams for all 256 possible categorical syllogisms if we felt like it. And by doing those diagrams, we would prove which ones are valid and which ones aren't. But fortunately, we don't have to do that much work. Remember, logicians never like to do more work than they have to, and it turns out that there are certain patterns that emerge among the invalid forms of categorical syllogisms. Those patterns allow us to articulate five rules that differentiate valid and invalid arguments in Aristotelian logic. By learning those five simple rules, we can apply them to evaluate any categorical syllogism to see whether or not it's valid. If a categorical syllogism fails one of the five rules we're going to learn, it is invalid, and we label it fallacious. Learning the five fallacies of categorical syllogisms is the quickest and simplest way of learning to recognize the difference between valid and invalid forms of all of our possible categorical syllogisms. You can still go on to do Venn diagrams for all of them if you have nothing better to do, but for now, let's just learn the rules. 
We'll start with the fallacy of the undistributed middle term. Remember, distribution exists when either the subject or predicate term of a categorical proposition is inclusive of all of the members of that set. In the A proposition, we know that the subject is distributed. In the E proposition, you'll recall both subject and predicate terms are distributed, and in the O proposition, the predicate is distributed. There is nothing distributed in the I proposition. We're now going to see just why learning that concept of distribution earlier was so important. Let's take a look at a AAA2 argument. Now, to make this a bit easier, I've added some content to our terms. All dogs are mammals. All cats are mammals. Therefore, all cats are dogs. Now, let's plug in the minor, major, and middle terms, that is, cats, dogs, and mammals, respectively. Next, we'll add the information from the premises, that is, what is it that the major and minor premises tell us to do on the diagram. Since the major premise asserts that all dogs are mammals, we are going to shade regions 6 and 7 to indicate that those regions are empty. Now we can see that all the remaining dogs are also members of the mammal class. Next, we add the information from the minor premise by shading out region 5. Now we see that all the remaining cats are also members of the mammal class. Now the question is, does the conclusion have to be true? Is it the case that all cats are dogs? We see that regions 2 and 4 are still potentially possible, so it may be that all cats are dogs, but then again, maybe not. Maybe there are cats that are non-dogs, and maybe there are dogs that are non-cats. But in deduction, a possible conclusion isn't good enough. We need a necessary conclusion. We need it to be the case that the conclusion has to follow if we assume that the premises are true. The premises in this argument do not force us to accept the conclusion, and therefore we say that this argument is invalid. We can visualize why this argument is invalid in the Venn diagram, but we also note how the middle term is undistributed in both the major and minor premises. If we were to construct other arguments with undistributed middle terms and then did a Venn diagram for those syllogisms, we would find that they also are invalid. Thus, we can adopt as a rule that a valid categorical syllogism must have a middle term that is distributed at least once. Failing to follow this rule will cause the syllogism to be fallacious. The second rule for a valid categorical syllogism also includes distribution, but this time it's going to be in reference to the major and the minor terms, and it will be slightly narrower in focus than on the middle term. In order to be valid, a categorical syllogism which contains a distributed term in the conclusion must also have that term distributed in the premise in which it's found. If the minor term, for example, is distributed in the conclusion, then it has to be distributed in the minor premise. And likewise, if a major term is distributed in the conclusion, it will have to be distributed in the minor premise. Let's take the following argument as an example. This is an AOO figure 1. All dogs are mammals. Some cats are not dogs. Therefore, some cats are not mammals. Now let's start with a blank Venn diagram and label all of our terms. We've got cats, mammals, and dogs. Starting with the major premise, both because it's first and also because it's universal, we are going to shade out regions 1 and 2 to indicate that there are no non-mammalian dogs. Now let's look at the minor premise. It says that there's at least one cat that is not a dog, so the x must fall in either regions 5 or 6. That would satisfy that premise. 
But since the premise is ambiguous as to where it should go, we put it on the line to indicate that it could in fact be in either region. If we chose to put it in region 5, we would be excluding region 6, which would mean that there's at least one cat that is not a dog and also not a mammal. But the premise doesn't tell us that, so we can't assume it either. Now, let's consider the conclusion. Some cats are not mammals. Must it be the case that there's at least one cat that is not a mammal? Since the minor premise was ambiguous about the inclusion or exclusion of the term mammal, we find that the conclusion might or might not be true, depending upon whether the one cat that was specified in the major premise happens to fall in region 5 or in region 6. Hence, this argument is said to be invalid. Since the major term is distributed in the conclusion, it should also be distributed in the major premise, but it wasn't. This argument has an illicit major term, and we would find exactly the same thing if it had been the minor term that was distributed in the conclusion, but not in the minor premise. That would be the fallacy of illicit minor premise, or illicit minor term. The third rule, which must be followed in order for a categorical syllogism to be valid, is that it cannot have two negative premises. There is no valid categorical syllogism which is an EE, -E, an EO, an OE, or an OO. Consider this example of an EOO1 syllogism. No fish are birds. Some parrots are not fish. Therefore, some parrots are not birds. Note that both the major and minor premises are negative. Following the exclusive premises rule, we would know that this argument is invalid since both of the premises are negative. But let's prove it, let's demonstrate it using a Venn diagram. First, let's label the terms of the argument, parrot, bird, and fish. Next, let's fill in the information from the major premise. No fish are birds. We're going to have to eliminate any members of the fish class that also happen to fall into the bird class. Now we're ready to add the information from the minor premise. That it tells us that there's at least one parrot that is not a fish. Again, note that the X could go in either regions 5 or 6, since the premise doesn't specify it's a non-bird parrot. Therefore, the X is going to have to go on the line. Now, let's think about the conclusion. Does it have to follow? It tells us that there's at least one parrot that is not a bird, suggesting that the X should be in region 5. But the minor premise didn't force us to do that. Hence, the conclusion is not necessarily true. This argument is invalid because it violates the rule of exclusive premises, as indeed would any other categorical syllogism that had two negative premises. The fourth rule that we have to learn is that a negative premise is always going to require a negative conclusion. Whether it's the major premise or whether it's the minor premise that's negative, it doesn't matter. If we have at least one negative premise, then we know the conclusion is also going to have to be negative. So, don't lose the negation. That's the key to this rule. As an example, let's take a look at this EII figure 1 argument. No fish are birds. Some parrots are fish. Therefore, some parrots are birds. First, label the terms. Parrots, bird, fish. Next, fill in the information from the major premise. No fish are birds. So we've eliminated all of the members that overlap between those two classes, so now the class of fish and the class of birds are completely distinct. Now add the information from the minor premise. Some parrots are fish. There's at least one parrot that is a fish. Note that the X must go in region 2 because region 3 was wiped out by the major premise. 
So there's only one place for it to go. Now look at the conclusion. Since the only parrot we know of exists in Region 2, the premises don't give us enough information to know that there's one in Region 6. So this argument is said to be invalid, and so too would all other categorical syllogisms that had a negative premise and an affirmative conclusion. Although their Venn diagrams might look a little different, it would still be the case that if you have a negative premise but not a negative conclusion, that argument is going to end up being invalid. So remember, don't lose the negative. Our final rule is based on our old friend existential implication. Remember how we learned that Aristotle restricts the use of categorical propositions to actually existing things so that using the rule of subalternation, that the truth of the universal entails the truth of the particular claim, is going to be a valid immediate inference. However, on the Boolean model, universals have no existential import, so there is no rule of subalternation. Universal propositions do not imply anything about particular propositions. They have no existential import, according to Boole. Therefore, universal propositions cannot entail particulars. So we've got a difference of opinion depending upon whether you're approaching these syllogisms from a Boolean or Aristotelian point of view. That same distinction is going to apply here when we're thinking about our categorical syllogisms. An argument that has two universal premises cannot, cannot entail a particular conclusion unless we specify that the terms refer to actually existing things. That is, from the Aristotelian point of view, a categorical syllogism with two universal premises and a particular conclusion is considered conditionally valid so long as the terms refer to actually existing things. But from a Boolean point of view, these syllogisms would be invalid. This is what we call the existential fallacy. Let's take a look at an example. In this syllogism, the major premise is a universal affirmative, so we're going to shade out regions 1 and 2. Next, we look at the minor premise, which is also a universal affirmative. It tells us that all parrots are feathered. So, we're going to have to shade out region 4, eliminating all the parrots that don't have feathers. Now we look at the conclusion, which says that there must be at least one feathered thing that is also a bird. Now, from the Aristotelian point of view, since parrots actually exist, then the conclusion must be true. There would be at least one parrot, and it would be both a bird and feathered. But from the Boolean point of view, we can't make an assumption about the existence of parrots since universal propositions, according to Boole, do not have existential import. Therefore, we would be unable to draw any conclusion about a particular feathered thing. This syllogism is said to be conditionally valid from the Aristotelian perspective so long as we assume that parrots exist. It would be un invalid on the Boolean point of view. Applying our five rules to all the possible categorical syllogisms, it turns out that 15 of those syllogisms will be unconditionally valid. That is, they're going to be valid from both the Aristotelian and the Boolean points of view. However, there will be a further nine syllogisms that will be conditionally valid. That is, they're going to be valid from the Aristotelian point of view, assuming the existence of the major, minor, or middle term, depending upon the figure and mood of that particular syllogism. So, that's it. That's all there is to learn for now. Now you have all the knowledge you need to build and to demonstrate the validity of categorical syllogisms. Hope you enjoyed the video. We'll see you next time.